Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Leadnap Gaming. Today we're going to dive into some of the Terra Firma talk from CitizenCon because I mentioned it when I was talking about the keynote the other day. There's some amazing dark magic taking place behind the scenes now that's dramatically different from most video games and this has a major impact on both the quality of the game, player experience, object container streaming, and the full release of the game. Watching the keynote demonstration was impressive for sure, but as some have pointed out in the comments since, they felt there was nothing special about it, as tons of games have weather effects and stuff, and sometimes they're actually even more visually stunning. For the purposes of explaining this, I'm going to summarize and cut down parts of that panel while contrasting them with other games like Modern Warfare, DCS, and Microsoft Flight Simulator. Understand that I'm going to try and deliver what was a fantastic, albeit technical, explanation of the panel into a layman's crash course. That means sometimes I'm going to oversimplify certain aspects. For you sharpshooters out there, this means there will be some technicalities that are ill-explained or omitted. If you can explain them in layman's terms better than I can, down in the comments please do so, because I really want people who watch this video to be able to understand all of this to the degree that they want to. Just like the panel, we do have to start at the beginning, both understanding how other video games build their maps, and how the early versions of the, gener of the tech and the next generation of CIG's tech works. In a standard FPS video game like Modern Warfare, the map is usually 1 to 3 kilometers square. Usually there are two layers of data that are used to create the map, a height map and a color map. These maps are usually built at a 1 meter resolution. What this also means is that it's based on the idea of what can you see from one meter away. A common example I've used in the past is, if you're inside of a house being framed and you're one meter away from the framed wall, you would see the nails in the wood. But if you're across the street, which is further away than one meter, you wouldn't see those nails. This results in a roughly five megabyte file size for the terrain map. Open world games like DCS or Ghost Recon trade one meter resolution for 10 kilometers kilometer resolution, which gives them a file size of roughly 30 megabytes. Now don't confuse this with detail resolution, we're talking about just the terrain. This is where the first problem comes into play. If CIG were to use this technique, each planet would require 500 terabytes of hard drive space on your computer. CIG isn't unique in running into this problem, of course, and the original solution is quite simple and commonplace, the use of procedural generation. That is certainly a term we hear a lot, and it simply means that rather than building every detail and storing it specifically, an algorithm is used as a generation tool. In other words, rather than storing on your hard drive the values for each square meter of Daymar, specific variables are plugged in that make Daymar unique, and the CPU runs an algorithm each time it needs to make the planet, thus getting the same result each time. To further oversimplify this, each time the game needs to render Hurston, it rebuilds it from recipe. This is easier to deliver than trying to transmit the entirety of Hurston and all of its properties and mass to your computer. Think of it also like scientific not notation. I can write out 35 million and send that to you, or I could reduce it to 3.5 E7. Now to re-get 35 million, you have to do some slight calculation but transmitting 3.5 E7 is much faster and smaller than 35 million. The other problem using traditional methods is the overhead of trying to render out these terrain maps for a planet the size of Hurston would require an impressive GPU. So CIG used four resolution levels. At the low altitude, they used the same resolution maps for an FPS shooter or an open world game and from space or high altitude resolutions similar to those of other space games like EVE Online, where you could get close to a planet but you never go down to it. This is why in the past as you descended onto a planet in game, two things would occur. One, you would visually see re-renderings of the planet before your very eyes, and more importantly two, from space the area might appear one color, but as you descended it would become a different one. That's because the two different maps had two different color values. This also had two other negative effects from the vision for Star Citizen. First, visual details from space aren't rich, and there's really hard transitions between the different biomes on each planet. The second, 
each planet essentially used two separate maps for resolution, so surface details from the surface map weren't visible from space. That later part's really important because if you ever tried to locate Samson and Sons or Junktown from orbit, you couldn't. You always had to know a large terrain feature to zero in on, and once you reached an altitude at which the resolution wear went from hundreds of kilometers to one meter, only then could you actually spot the destination. The solution to this is quite radical, because again, it's based around procedural generation of the planet. To understand that, we have to break down the data set. I know this is dry stuff and it's taking a while, but hang in there because once we grasp this, the real dark magic gets revealed. The original planet tech was broken down into five layers, or maps. Color, height, normal, distribution, and index. Planet tech V4 instead only uses four layers, height, normals, humidity, and temperature. The normals map is related for shadows details, so going forward we're not going to focus on that and only talk about the three critical maps that build our worlds. The first thing CAG does is build the height map. The new layers are the most important, temperature and humidity. Essentially, just like the real world, they use how water acts to fill out the algorithm for procedural generation. This not only models erosion in, in the creation of the height map, but it also determines everything like ground color, flora placement, and biome. In previous versions, biomes were hand-painted onto planets, now they're procedural. And that's important for something else we're going to touch on in just a second. This is that room tech that Chris Roberts was talking about during the keynote, because it plays such a major role in everything about planetary gameplay. Now, remember a moment ago I explained that they used to hand-paint the biomes. Understand now that there are 128 steps for humidity, and 128 steps per, for temperature per planet. That means there's 16,000 variations possible, and that means essentially, for our purposes, there are 16,000 biomes on every planet. You can't hand paint that. Constructed out of nine principal biomes like desert, polar desert, temperate rainforest, and so on, the result means that in areas where principal biomes meet, like the polar biome and a tundra biome, now you have gradients of these different 16,000 biomes between the two, which creates that kind of soft edge and transition instead of the hard edge of one biome to another. The other major result of this is they can now strip out the orbital maps altogether, allowing ships in space to see the exact ground details on the surface. In other terms, as you descend on Samson and Sons, you can find it from space and see it the whole way down. The panel went into a ton of detail on this, but I want to diverge here and get into the meat and potatoes for our purposes. I'm going to put the link to Nubifier's recording of the panel down in the description below if you want to watch it in full, and there's a lot of really good stuff in there that I have not talked about here. In the demo, we saw a person walk, then drive, then fly through a storm. What is important about this tech is not just how much faster they can create unique planets and deliver them to our computers with low overhead. The room tech is what really steals the show. To begin with, the physics mesh and terrain model are now unified. The planet's generation is also its physical grid. Not only helpful for not falling through the planet, but most importantly, the CPU generates both the terrain data and the physical mesh in the same pass using all available cores. This is a major processing reduction while simultaneously providing small FPS level map details over millions of kilometers of planet. The demo looked amazing, sure, but we've had weather in video games for a long time. The dark magic behind the weather is what is important to grasp here. In Modern Warfare, one of the levels takes place in a snowstorm. While visually both Star Citizen and Mountain Warfare were alike, both had blowing snow, snowflakes, and wind, how they're created is dramatically different. When you round a corner in Modern Warfare, a gust of wind blew snow in an animation that was designed and built for that corner. The effect was tuned and repeats every time you play the level. Even semi-procedural animations like the clouds obscuring the mountains temporarily in the background are just that, an animation. This is not what took place when we watched the demo at Citizen Con's keynote. The player was walking along terrain effectively in a room. This room or area had specific humidity and temperature properties, which when calculated spit out visible anim animations from the storm. It was very hard to see in the demo, but as the rover moved from one of those 16,000 biomes to another during the change in elevation, this resulted in a change in the humidity and temperature values, and the animations adjusted accordingly. So using our example from above, when the player rounded the corner and the wind was stronger and the snow grew thicker and the fog intensified, 
This wasn't programmed like the level in Modern Warfare. Rather, it was simulated. In other terms, when you play the snow level in Modern Warfare, it's programmed. The different animations were positioned on the map by programmers. CIG has instead built a simulation. The storm is rendered from data on the terrain model. I'll make another example here. The lighting level in that Modern Warfare map is set by the programmer. When the storm rolled in on the mountainside on Microtech, the amount of sunlight allowed through the cloud layer was instead based on the simulation of the weather and the thickness of the clouds, which is tied to the construction of the planet. Again, this is all a major reduction in processing overhead, stored data, and importantly created a dynamic, repeatable, yet not identical player experience. When you play that mission in the future, it could be a sunny afternoon, the storm could have arrived earlier, later, or could be completely different. In the most simple terms, CIG spent years building a planetary climate simulator, and now we get to play in it. The result is important for three reasons. First, in a matter of months, they can build whole systems with a rich variety of individual planets and biomes. Second, the visuals are stunning and lifelike, while generating whole layers of gameplay loop, like armor needs and vehicle constraints. Third, the hardware overhead and bandwidth requirements to have such detail are vastly minimized. Now, the demonstration used a fixed wind model to generate the weather pattern for the show. Needed both to ensure that we actually saw the tech demonstrated, after all, if when they played it through at CitizenCon and it turned out to be a sunny afternoon, the demo would have been rather dull. Also, the weather tech is still being refined for dynamic weather. Now, yes, games like DCS have a dynamic weather model, but these are both hand-programmed for the constraints. For example, in DCS I can set wind speed direction uh, at different altitudes, right, or I can let it auto-populate that data, but that model's not tied to the terrain model. On both sides of a mountain face, for example, the wind is going to be the same. That's not the same in Star Citizen, though. In Microsoft Flight Simulator, there is also a dynamic weather model, which is much closer to what the room tech and what CAG has, and it does interact somewhat with the terrain we're told, but it's not built together in the same pass since the terrain model is a replication from Google Earth. Again, folks, this is a rough summary and explanation of the tech, and I know it was long and dry in spots, but for me, this is what really stole the show. We know Pyro's being added to the game, and the truth is, this time next year, we could very well have more than even two systems. Even if the cities aren't fully developed for them, having multiple systems and being able to generate them pushes us much closer to that 100 system promise we were given in the beginning. Furthermore, snow, ice, sand, and other effects are all tied to this model, which includes how the planetary flight model acts as well. Let me know in the comments below if you want me to break down more of the panels like this one, and do feel free to explain out anything I oversimplified. Thank you all for watching, and as always, don't forget to hit like and subscribe, and I will catch you all next time.